Welcome on in to the latest edition of Falls Con Anywhere podcast. I'm Charlie Turner along with co-host Chris DiCarlo. Yes, sir. Chris, how we doing, man? Good good week? Not too bad, uh, but it seems like winter won't leave us alone. No, it won't, man. That's all right, though. We're going to we're gonna get there, damn it. We're going to get some uh, summer before this year is over, hopefully. Uh, some spring first, then maybe some summer, right? Yeah. But uh, before we get to that, we gotta got some uh, wrestling to talk about. Uh, of course, we want to get to our... Uh, chic tweets later on in our show. We got some classic clips as well from uh, Mr. DiCarlo here as he unleashes the uh, DVD vault, if you will. Uh, before we do that, though, of course, we want to bring in this week's guest. We were very honored to have him. Uh, he was uh, formerly part of the NWA Central State. He is a former uh, tag team champion in that uh, territory. He also wrestled under Jim Crockett promotions. And he is our guest today. He is Mr. Gene Ligon. Mr. Ligon, thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast, sir. How are you today? I'm doing great today, guys. How y'all doing? Oh, doing fantastic, man. We're, uh, like I said, we're trying to thaw out here in western New York. I understand you're in the uh, Minnesota area, Minneapolis area, correct? Do I have that right? Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm oh, down here. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Okay, I, sh I should have known better. My bad. <laughs> we're off to a, a great start here with my uh, research, right? <laughs> uh, well, That's all right. Sir, well, sir, we are, uh, we are absolutely uh, pleased to have you on our show today. And, of course, we want to talk about a little classic wrestling with you as, you know, we focus on that here on our show. And we got some clips of, you, of yourself a little bit later on wrestling uh, Ric Flair back in the day and whatnot. Uh, but we wanted to ask you about as wrestling fans, you know, um, first, I guess my first question would be, you know, what uh, inspired you to get into the wrestling business? And what was that like once you got your foot into the door? Oh, Lord, I, I was... Uh living in Charleston, South Carolina as a little boy, about five years, four or five years old. We used to watch wrestling on, I think it was Channel 2 down there. And uh, I just like love watching wrestling. It was just fun. My granddaddy liked it. My cousins liked it. I watched all the time. I got a picture of me, actually a black and white picture of me standing on a little ottoman and a pair of whitey tidies, and I'm <laughs> acting like a wrestler. And I said, man, started somewhere. I used to watch it all the time, and I enjoyed it. And I never been to a match, never saw a match. I just saw it on TV. And uh, Big Bill Ward was the uh, announcer. Uh, WBTV out of Charlotte would spread, you know, send out different clips all over. And so they sent the tapes down to Charleston. Charleston X Wrestling coming to the Charleston Township Auditorium. That's what we uh, never got to go because it cost money. And my dad had his own business and. Basically, a dollar was a dollar. That's a lot of money. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, that's how I got, got liking it and everything. And I I got to get in at a time because I was a school teacher. Um, in 1975, 76, I was teaching. My first year as kindergarten teacher, uh, K through 5, taught elementary physical education. And I'd gone to a match to watch, um, let's see, Rip Hawk and Sweet Hansen for a loser leave town match. <laughs> they had they were best of buddies, so they were tag team partners. We hated them both. But Sweet <laughs> was always the gentle giant. So uh, took a buddy of mine with me, went all the way to Greensboro to watch them wrestle. First first time I seeing one live like that. First time I saw well, actually first time I saw one live I was in college and they came to Shelby uh, Recreation Park. Don Cronodal was there. Uh, uh, Johnny Valentine was there. They had a small match. And that was the first time I saw a lot. I was impressed. I didn't think none of it. I was 160 pounds. What am I going to do? <laughs> so uh, I had a rest, high school wrestling college background there. But I was too small. But I was refereeing wrestling and stuff like that and uh, high school wrestling and stuff. And a uh, chance to go see Sweet Eyes. A good match. They built it up so big. This is the final. One of these guys is leaving town. Never come back. So we went to Greensboro. Swede beat Rip. Rip had to leave town. 
Yeah. And I didn't understand the business. I'm, I'm a mark. I'm a mark and a half. <laughs> still a mark. Some people are still a mark. What are you doing? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That's all right. So, so I go back. I go back to uh, home, and I'm calling matches for high school wrestling. And Charlotte Catholic Wrestling is wrestling against um, East Gaston, I believe it was East Gaston. And I'm refereeing the matches. I don't know anybody on. I know East Gaston coach really good. Don't know the other coach at all. And the buddy of mine that went with me it was a girl, by the way. Went with me. She said, as the match was over, she run over to me. She said, "You won't believe who's here." I said, "Who?" She said, "That guy we watched the other night that got to lose town." I said, "What?" My mind had sweet hands on my brain. Right. And looked up and I looked up and saw this man coming across the, the, the court towards me. I'm like, holy cow, it's him. And it was Rip Hawk. And I'm like, I said, hey, Mr. Hanson. He said, I said, I mean, Mr. Hawk. He said, how you doing? He says, son, you ought to come watch us. Uh, we're doing some taping in Kings Mountain this weekend. You ought to come watch. I said, well, I'd love to, but I don't have any money to spend extra money like that. He said, I got your pass. So he uh, oh, nice. met me at the door, invited me into Kings Mountain, where they did several weeks of taping all in one one over a three-day period uh, for the IWA. Kangaroos, uh, Bill Mascaris, Tex McKenzie, the the Tex McKenzie, all them guys. And the funny thing about it, Tommy Young was wrestling. He actually wrestled in a match and then he actually refereed a few matches. He did a great job refereeing, I thought. So uh, that's my first introduction to it. And I said, well, I might try out one day. I said, Come on. So never, nothing ever came of it. And then I was teaching. I left that school. I was teaching out there. Went to a high school to teach wrestling and coach coach uh, wrestling and football. And my kids that I was wrestling with, practicing with, I was 160 pounds. Like I said, Coach, you need to go out for pro wrestling. I said, Shut up. <laughs> I was a gymnast in college, so I, I could do some flips and stuff. But right. Yeah. We, I took all of them to a pro wrestling match in Charlotte Coliseum one time. Took the whole wrestling team. We went down to watch it just to get a, you know, have a, 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 you know, basically a bonding situation. And they didn't call it bonding back then. We called having fun. And so we <laughs> went down there and came back. And sure enough, middle of the night, IWA was on TV, said, you want to be a wrestler? And uh, I said, you're kidding me. So I sent a little note in, letter to where they sent it to, said, meet at Triad Arena in Greensboro, North Carolina. So I got in the car and I found out where it was because there's no GPS back then. So I drove all the way there and got there and there's Johnny Johnny Powers and uh, Dino Bravo, hmm. a couple of other guys that were famous in the IWA. I didn't know them that well. I'd seen them, but uh, they had us try out with about 40 guys and uh, it was a uh, it was something else because we're all on the edge, you know. And he said. He looked, he, I kept looking at him because I wanted to get my attention and uh, him get, I get his attention. And Johnny Power said, you, come here. I said, oh, I stepped in the ring. I'm 160 pounds. He puts a headlock on me, showed me how to apply a headlock properly, professional wrestling. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I figured out how to do this. And uh, so he put me against a guy that was a big old burly looking guy, 300 pounds, had a beard. Oh, I said, my gosh, looks like one of the hillbillies. <laughs> and I, he said, uh, Eric the Red, get the corner over here. It was actually just another guy trying out, and I'd met yeah. earlier, but he was a butthead. He was being a, I mean, he was just being a real butt. I was like, holy cow! I thought we were supposed to hear all together trying to learn business, and uh, he was a butthead to me. He was rude and all this <laughs> stuff. I thought, my gosh, I said, I'm 106 pounds. He's 300. I'm gonna get my butt whooped here. I don't know if this guy knows how to do karate or. Knows how to do uh, street fighting or anything. <laughs> so I got in the ring. All of a sudden, he said, I want you to charge. This guy's going to charge uh, you or you charge him. And he's going to put his foot up, put it in your chest and knock you down. I said, okay. A little spot there, you know. I, I didn't know it was called a spot, but that's what I did. I run across to him. He put his foot up, kicked me right in the mouth. Oh, so man. Knocked me out. <laughs> and I said, what the? And, and, and I know he probably didn't mean it on purpose, but he looked at me and he laughed. I went, you laughing? All right. I got up. I said, have him come to me. He said, Johnny, so no, we got somebody. No, I want him coming to me. He said, okay. So he said, all right. Come to me. And, and I had, I knew how to do gymnastics. Have my, I do an L seat, stick the leg straight out in front like a lever you do on a pair of rings. 
he come running across. I put both of them right on his eyes. Bam, he's down. Oh man! And he's laying there going, oh, he's moaning. I went, oh gosh, I felt bad because I'm just not that kind of guy. And I felt bad for him. And I helped him up. I said, you okay? He said, yeah, I'm okay. Sorry about that while ago. I didn't mean to. I said, I know. His name was Ken. He worked for Lexington Recreation Department, helped teach tennis. <laughs> He's just a guy trying out. But he was being mean and rough because he was scared to death. That's you humbled him, though. You, all, all 160 yeah, pounds well, of you uh, humbled said, his 300-pound <laughs> ass, right? <laughs> well, he he turned out to be a, a sweet guy and everything. And, uh, he, yeah, but we just got along great after that. And then I met a new friend there named Chuck. And Chuck and I started together as a tag team. And uh, we knew nothing about the working part of the business. We thought it was all legit. We were faking it as best as we could to make it look real. And uh, our first matches, our first 20 matches, we about beat each other to death, laying punches in real hard, you know, bo full body punches. And we we're exhausted after each match. And we go back to the dressing room. I go to the good guys. He go to the bad guys section. I lay on the ground like I'm, I'm worn out because I was in decent shape, but I was exhausted. And I'm looking at these guys smoking cigarettes, playing cards, go out for 20, 30 minutes, come back with a little bit of sweat on the brow. I'm like, what am I doing wrong here? These guys have a workout. I can't, it's like, it must be in the best shape in the world because I thought I was in pretty good shape. But uh, then I had to wrestle against Rip Tyler. And Rip Tyler, uh, they told him, go talk to Rip. I said, about what? I said, workout a finish. I said, huh? I said, yeah, go work out a finish. I go over there and Rip says, Tell you what I do, I'll put a sleeper on the end of it. We'll just do some Shakespeare in the middle. I went, let me ask something. You mean all this stuff is just pretend? He said, yeah. What do you think we're doing? Kill each other? I, said, <laughs> I didn't know. Because <laughs> I was a mark. <laughs> right. So after that, I learned, I learned, I tried to learn a little bit more about how to handle it. And it took five years, six years off, but, you know, because of uh, jobs and stuff like that. And I didn't get back into it until Crockett 1982 or 83, I think it was. And started doing it, and I, the guy asked me, says, you want to try out? I said, oh, no, I'm not doing this again. Mm -hmm. And uh, But they had us go through a tryout, did all that, and the uh, guy says, what do you want? I said, I want a job. So I'll do anything you want me to do. I, I, I'm, I'm a, a guy that shows up for work. So they hired me. Next thing I know, I'm a little bit once a week, twice a week, three times a month. They were testing me, and they, I stuck with it. And they finally worked me into it, and then... 1987, I think it was, we turned to the Thunderfoots, came to Thunderfoots, and uh, me and Joel Deaton did that for a while. And went to Kansas City and won the Central State Championships and took that title and, you know, had that for a little bit of time and then came back to, came back to North Carolina and finished up my career there. That actually, you know, uh, you know that's... a little Australian. Yeah, you know, that, that brings me to my next question. You mentioned the Thunderfoots. I was going to ask you, um, as far as, like, tag team wrestling, did you um, did you prefer more a, a tag team, uh, having a tag team partner, oh, yeah. or did you like more of the solo act? Oh, yeah. and, well, and the other part uh, of that question team. is, uh, well, the other part of that question is you were also a masked wrestler at that point. Did you prefer being a masked wrestler, or would you rather be without the mask, and, you know, which did you like better? Absolutely with a mask. I, I did not have the background. A lot of these guys had theatrical. You know, they're like, they'd make faces and stuff like that. I was sort of deadpan faced. I, I had to learn how to express myself. On the inside, I'm making a face, but on the outside, I was just standing there looking at it. You, know? right. <laughs> so you, gotta, you gotta get it. But putting a mask on, you kind of you kind of go into this character and you can be a real bad guy without feeling bad about it because you're being a character. And, uh, as Gene Ligon, I had, I wanted to be Gene Ligon, and I was just trying to be a wrestler. But as a Thunderfoot, I could kick and stomp and do all kinds of stuff. It's much more fun being a bad guy. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Hey, Mr. Ligon, uh, I've watched you, yeah, since uh, Mid Atlantic, NWA, WCW. Uh, got a couple of clips. I didn't know you were in the WWF back in uh, '88, '89, but uh, oh. then you were in the. Uh, I got. I got footage uh -oh. of the <laughs> NAWA with you and uh, Ted Webb and huh? Ricky the Dragon Streamboat. Yeah. That was great. I did a. They called me because they started the NAWA. Um, uh, Nelson Roll, a couple of them, and they got me doing an interview where I'm in a tuxedo and everything. Yes. Uh, I showed up. I showed up to wrestle because I wanted to help out a little bit, but I was the only one that had. You know, had had any experience at all talking to anybody. I was a teacher. 
So he said, we got we got to have somebody do the, the commentate. I said, huh? Here, put this outfit on. So, <laughs> so they they sucked me into that, and I did all that from straight up, didn't know nothing. And a few weeks after that, one guy who was the number one guy they had got sick or something like that, and couldn't couldn't show up. And all of a sudden, I was the TV commentator. So I had about three shows I did TV commentating on, and uh, they ran out of money after a while, and so that was the end of that. But uh, I went to the WWF. Uh, uh, they they they'd had a lot of injuries up there, and we had a crew of good, you know, guys that would go out there and do the job right. And uh, we didn't call them jobbers; we we called match enhancers. <laughs> ah, very <laughs> good. Or enhancement you know, talent, somebody, right? Yeah. Some, yeah, yeah. Some of these guys, without us doing it, they'd look like jerks. I mean, they just didn't have the talent, and uh, we had to make them look good. So we'd enhance their ma- whatever they could do. We could make it look better. We went up there because they'd injured so many of their guys that would just go out there and weren't, weren't really wrestlers. They just beat them up and made them look bad. It was a rough, rough bunch of guys. So we went up there, and they're thinking we're the same kind of guys. We're just going to go up there and get our butts whooped, and they'd haul off and smack the crap out of you. And you're like, oh, well, wait a minute here. They're laying it in pretty hard. So I was sitting up there be the guy to handle the money and also wrestle and i had the warrior ultimate warrior and everybody said he's crazy i'm telling you and so we're there right you know, found a way to get him tired before he beat on me <laughs> but some of the guys were being very very rough rough handed they were being very rough handed they didn't consider us worthy but we got up there and our guys were getting hurt i said the mat was a little harder a lot harder and i'm like Listen, guys, somebody lays a punch in on you. I gather them all together and said, somebody lays a punch on you, you lay them out right on the spot. They had a bunch of country boys that didn't mind getting a little tussle, but they were trying to earn a living. Right. I said, you got permission, lay them out. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, a few guys threw a f- couple hard punches. Now here comes back old country boy, whop, right into the spot. Oh, what the? They, they come out, what are y'all hitting us for? I said, you're going to get what you give. If you keep it up, Somebody's going to look really foolish, but some of these boys can kick y'all's tails. Some of y'all are just bodybuilders. Right. Some of these guys actually have a wrestling background. I said, don't mess with us. We're not your, We're not the guys you've been beating up every week. And they'd give me the money to hand out to everybody, and I handed out the money to everybody. And at the end of it, the envelope had still had a lot of money in it. And I went back to the, the guy who gave me money. I said, listen, you gave us too much money. I'd have taken my fee out, took everybody's fee out they're supposed to get. And they said... All the rest of it's yours. I said, mine? Why is it? That's a test. They now know we can trust you. So I, you know, I was just thought they gave us too much money. So do like an extra $500 in the, in the pot. I'm like, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so uh, that was a way of, uh, they had a way of, they had a sneaky way of doing things. You know, it's wow, going to be a yeah. wise way of doing things. Because, you, know, you know, you don't know what, if you all of a sudden I paid everybody $50 rather than 190 they're supposed to get or 200 they're supposed to get. And uh, for one match, and if I'd paid him 150, kept the rest for myself, because some guys did that. I said, I can't do that. These are, these are. I'm not a crook. First of all, I'm not, I'm not a thief. And uh, so I was like, wow, I got rewarded for doing the right thing. So I always try to do the right thing. Sometimes I fail. So I try to do the right thing, purposely. So that was yeah, that was my uh, experience at WFM. It was rough. That's very cool. Yeah. Good you food, know, but- yeah, that, you know, I've did heard you, that more than uh, once. The uh, catering there is pretty top notch there. <laughs> yeah, real quick though, Mr. Ligon, did you uh meet or talk to Vince McMahon or just got in there? Never spoke never spoke to Vince. Never spoke to Vince. I saw Vince come walking out of the dressing room one time kind of rocking because somebody had laid him out. Uh oh. That would be the famous uh that would be the famous uh, one of the one of the guys, let's see, uh Blue Blazers brother. I can't think of his name right now. Oh, there. Bret Hart. Uh, Oh, the the Montreal yeah, screw job, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, he he, they, they did him wrong. I mean, the guy agreed. Yeah, he was one of the best wrestlers in the world. They did him wrong, and he just went in. McMahon took a shot. <laughs> He's a tough guy, but uh, man, one of the best loogies right in the history of uh, professional wrestling. That that loogie that the hitman dropped into McMahon's eye from about ten feet was one of the best uh, loogies I've ever seen oh. in wrestling history. <laughs> oh yeah. Those guys, those guys knew how to do a loogie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ligon, too, uh, did you uh, have an interaction with, we had Mr. David Crockett on the show, as I told you, uh, 
few uh, months ago, and uh, did you talk? Yeah, talk to David, Bob Cardle, uh, Jim Crockett. I, I haven't talked. To, uh, yeah, I used. To, I knew them real well. I was, you know, I was, I was a company guy. I mean, I, I showed up for work every day, and David was one of the nicest guys in the world to me. Uh, uh, all the other guys were always. We had a family in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's what we were. And some guys came in and some guys left, but there was that one core group. And uh, I had to referee for a year because I tore pec muscle. I went in the office and I spent all the money I'd earned on the hospitalization and had my pec muscle repaired. And I went in the, I went in the office one day, talked to Jim Crockett. I said, Mr. Crockett, I need, I need a favor if you can do this for me. I need to borrow $1,500 so I can kind of you know, pay my bills and you know, pay my mom and dad some money and stuff. They'd, they'd loan me money and said, uh, well, I don't loan money. I said, oh, okay. It's because wrestlers will screw you in a long time. Mm -hmm. So just at that very moment, Dusty Rhodes comes busting in the door, knocks the door in, and uh, he said, son of a gun. He said, I had to fire the referee down in, down in Georgia um, because uh, he was drunk. I got no referee to go to Fayetteville. And I'm sitting there with a sling, my left arm in a sling, and I, I looked at him and said, I can do it. Well, Ligon, you can't do it. you got an arm messed up. So I took my arm out of my sling, put it in my pocket, because the peck was tender. <laughs> and uh, surgery is just the week before. I, oh, wow. So I was like, okay. So I dropped down on the ground, put my hand on the ground. I, did, I slapped it three times. I pushed myself back up with my right arm and stood up. I said, is that basically what I got to do? I said, yeah, that's it. But I wrestled, I refereed college and high school. I knew how to referee. But pro wrestling, you know, that'd stay out of the way. I said, I can do that. I can get up and get back down. I said, you want to do it? I said, yeah. You got gear? I said, I got referee stuff. I don't have any black shoes. He said, don't worry about the black shoes. They're white shoes. So I didn't have no spare money to go buy some shoes. Right, yeah. <laughs> so I took off, took off to Fayetteville, had a match that night, uh, refereed all those matches. and. Johnny Weaver's there and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm the ref. He said, oh my gosh. <laughs> he said, how are you going to do it? I said, it's going to be tough, but I'll do it. And uh, as matches went by, the shoulder was still bad, neck still bad. I did Starcade, I think it was 85, where I refereed uh, um, the Barbarian and, uh, not Barbarian, Barbarian and, and uh, Superstar Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. And uh, did, uh, did um, Abdul the Butcher and the Raging Bull. And I had to keep Tom, uh, Paul Jones out of the uh, ring. I grabbed him one hand. I said, Paul, my shoulder's really bad. He said, okay. Pulled on him. I said, okay. He'd, he'd work it really good. You know, he's like, I just pushed me back and things like that. And then, then finally, you know, the guy, I saw the finish from uh, Dusty going for the world. Best of time. Um, I was in the back watching it with the rest of the guys. No one knew to finish. No one. And I'm sitting there, there's Tommy Young, gets knocked out of the ring, hits the ground. I said, well, how are they going to finish this? I reached up, so I tapped me on the shoulder. Ligon, go to the ring and finish the match. Lost the finish, go to the ring. So I took off running. I get to the ring, slide through, if you don't notice it. That was one of my first few matches I'd done. And I'm sitting there looking around, and Tommy's on the floor, and I'm looking at Dusty Rhodes, and... Rick Flair and they're wrestling. Boop, boop. Next thing, I, they all knew I had a reputation that I slapped the mat. You better get your shoulder up. I will right. slap it in my opinion. <laughs> I'm not going. I'm not going to do that one, two, and then all of a sudden hold it for three seconds. I'm going one, two, and three. And they knew that's how it was. So there it was. One, two, and three. Rick Flair just got pinned, and now the title goes to Rick. I said, I have screwed up big time. I'm no oh, man. Boy. I've been fired. <laughs> So I raised, I raised Dusty's hand. I'm like, holy crap, I'm done. And sure enough, here comes Tommy crawling back through saying, now, disqualification, elbow, elbows to the chest. I said, I said, wow, no one knew. Only one that knew was the Crockett's and Dusty and Flair. Wow. And of course, Tommy. Right. And so they, they kept a secret. I said, that was cool. That was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> How was uh, Mr. Jim Ross? Ross was, I, I only met him a few times. He's a very nice man. And uh, it was not, I don't have to say bad about anybody because generally I think you bring to the conversation 
generally how they're going to act. I was always respectful to somebody. They were always respectful back to me. And uh, just I, I never had a problem with anybody in the business. I mean, I had one guy jump me one time, but that was no big deal. We, we worked that out. And uh, it's just uh, some people, you know, they looked at the business. It's a, it's a hard-nosed business. I mean, it's a, it's a you take what you can get sort of thing. And uh, Right, yeah. Just I yeah. wasn't raised that way. I want to try to help Le somebody get part of it. Mr. Ligon, real quick, too, another name I'll throw at you. We had uh, his son on, uh, the legendary Mr. Gordon Soli. We had his son, Gennard, on, and he's a good friend of the show and a oh. good man. I I, I, I met I met Gordon one time to say, hey, how you doing? But I watched him on TV from independent channels, and Gordon Soli was fantastic. He was just amazing. He was a great, great commentator. Yeah. And uh well, you know, Gene, um, we um, we could we I could sit here and listen to these stories for the next uh, few hours, man. And I know you're time sensitive, but man, we love hearing this stuff because it's like the uh, for us as fans, like to hear some of the inner workings of wrestling. You know, as you talked about, is a super cool for us to listen to these stories. Uh, Gene, anytime you want to come back and join us on this podcast and share some wrestling uh, history with us, if you will, uh, we would love to have you back again down the road, sir. But we uh, again, we know your time is sensitive and. We just want to say thank you so much for taking some time out of your uh, morning to uh, your afternoon to join us today, sir. Well, guys, I, I, I know this weekend's a, a big weekend, the Easter weekend, Resurrection Day. Yeah. Yes, sir. I know that yep. uh, my life, uh, my life was a changed man from years and years and years ago. That uh, Jesus Christ was the reason for the season, and uh, this weekend is a special weekend for Christians. And uh, so, I'll let everybody know that uh, God loves you, and. Uh, Get to know a little bit more about Christ, and we'll be ready to go. Amen to that, yes, sir. Thanks, guys. Happy, Appreciate uh, you asking me. It's an honor for y'all to ask. I, I was honored that you asked. Uh, we were honored to have you, sir. Yeah, uh, definitely anytime, appreciate uh, it. Yeah, yes, I've sir. been a fan since 1980, so I definitely appreciate it. Yeah, so when we get you gentlemen oh on gosh. here and, and talk some wrestling with us, uh, it's You're... invaluable to us. We love it, man. You sound awful young to be 1980, aren't right? you? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to be 47 next week, but I started when I was five years oh. old. Wow, I'm 71 now. I'll be 72 in a few more months, October 10th. And so, uh, if I make it, Lord's will, and I'll, I'll see, see you another time. Call me anytime. You want to talk? We're glad to. Just have driver's education day. I got these two kids. I got to finish up. They did really good. We didn't get killed, so we're going to drive them back to the school, give them their certificate, and then I'm heading home. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what. If there's any uh, a point where Jesus should be with you, it's during driver's education, right? So uh, we're gonna. Hey, yeah, I, so. Everybody says. Uh, Everybody says, God is my co-pilot. I said, you better get him out of the car quick. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you, Gene. Uh, again, thank you, sir, for uh, joining us. And uh, we look forward to having you back again sometime, sir. God bless you guys. Take care. Same to you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. That is Mr. Uh, Gene Ligon joining us today on our show. Uh, again, man, it, it, just to hear the, some of those stories. And we just uh, got to the tip of the iceberg uh, with yeah. Mr. Ligon there. Uh, I feel like we could have asked him a thousand more questions. I could have sat here all day and listened to that. It was great. Uh, so thank you so much, Gene. And uh, we're going to do a quick commercial break. And uh, we're going to come right back with some more False Con Anywhere podcast. Stick with us.
Letchworth State Park is truly spectacular. Everyone should have the opportunity to enjoy this wonder of nature. The Autism Nature Trail at Letchworth will provide ADA-compliant accessibility and allow those with autism, as well as visitors of all ages and abilities, to push boundaries, explore new activities, and develop skills. Go to AutismNatureTrail.com to learn more, and please help support this important project. All right, and we are back. Uh, thank you again to Mr. Gene Ligon for joining us on today's show, for today's interview. Wade, i got to ask you, buddy. Wade, our producer over here, is a uh, Patriots fan. And I noticed Patriot landscaping. Is there some kind of, like, tie there, man? Don't be – this is Bill's country, you know, buddy. You know, I don't want none of this Patriot stuff on this channel, you know what I mean? But if it's for landscaping purposes – we're all aboard for that, as long as it has something to do with Bill Belichick or like Tom Nothing Brady. Nothing to do with right? Bill Belichick. Right. Like they, we, we, I, I, like, I love the names. So, yeah, uh, I figured you would, right? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we're kidding, man, but we thank all of our sponsors here at uh, Gorillas Inc. And, um, you know, check them out because uh, we got some good ones. Um, but, yeah, as we uh, continue on here on our humble little podcast, we want to give a shout out to our buddy Mick Karch, uh, former guest here of the show. Um, is just a uh, press release just went out the other day. MAW is now going to be picked up by CW Twin Cities. That's the CW in the uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota area. It's like a local channel. Uh, it's going to be debuting next week, April the 23rd at 11 p.m. It's actually going to be filling in uh, for the time slot where Ring of Honor was. So now uh, CW Twin Cities is going to be picking up that time slot and are going to be airing um, Mid All-Star Wrestling Warriors is going to be the name of the show. Um, so be sure to check that out. And if you can, if you're not in that area, uh, there's going to be ways to check that out online. Of course, we'll have some information available as uh, that gets uh, fired up and going. Yeah, that's great. I hope I can watch it. Yeah, absolutely. So congrats to uh, Mick Karch, who's uh, going to be a big part of that, um, as he announced in his press release there. Um, and also, speaking of Mick Karch and our uh, former guest, Christopher Tubbs, and hopefully future guest, Mr. George Shire, uh, their AWA Unleashed podcast uh, that we fully support. We love it. Uh, they're going to be doing their first live show uh, on June 11th. It's going to be at the Lift Bridge Brewing Company. That's going to be in Stillwater, Minnesota. I think is where I was getting all this Minnesota stuff. Yeah, and I right. was talking to Gene there, and uh, he said, no, I'm in North Carolina, dude. Like, yeah, I'm in Minnesota in my brain, and who knows what else. But anyway, uh, they're going to be doing that live bro uh, broadcast, podcast, uh, prior to the upcoming MAW Border Battle Show. So uh, be sure to... Check that out again. That's June 11th, and look for their uh, social media or anything online uh, for more updates on that. And we'll continue to provide that as well on this show. Um, but Chris, of course, we want to uh, bring in our, our buddy here, John Restino, who I inconsistently forget to bring in properly. And Chris usually saves my ass on that, but today I remembered. Uh, John, welcome on in, man. You're healthy. You're doing good. Yeah, feel better now. Good. Good. You were hacking all over the studio. I was nervous, man. I didn't yeah. want to leave here and get sick. You know? No, I know. It was bad last Saturday. Then we'd have a match here. And I then, know. You know. Loser leave town. Yeah, loser yeah. leave town. <laughs> That's right. I'm exactly. leaving town. <laughs> <laughs> and then masked wrestlers, I'd be in a mask the next week. You know, yeah, we don't want to right. do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, Chris, we got some. Uh, we're going to unload the vault. We're going to Chic first, right? Before yes. we do the vault. That's right. What am I thinking? How can I we forget the right? Chic yeah. every week? One of these weeks, I'm going to put it all together and we're going to have a complete <laughs> show. But anyway, uh, we want to check in with the Iron Chic. Now, the Chic. And I notice, and I'm sure you notice if you uh, follow his Twitter feed, he has about 100 different ways of telling you to go fuck yourself, right? And uh, this first tweet here, the good news is you're not a jabroni. The bad news is you're a dumb son of a bitch. Now, you didn't actually <laughs> go after yourself or anything, but the Sheik is always uh, full of compliments. And at first, you're kind of thinking, oh, hey, you know, the good news is we're not a jabroni. Right. Yeah. But, you know, you are a dumb son of a bitch, so there's that, too. Um, the Sheik also, you know, we there was some sad news in the entertainment world uh, this week. You know, it's been a bad uh, 2022 as far as losing some celebrities, man. We lost Mr. Gilbert Gottfried. Um, the Sheik looks like he did uh, meet Gilbert Gottfried previously. He said he made him laugh every time he saw him in the comedy world would be broken because, uh, uh, you know, he cares so much for him. I love you forever, Bubba, type of deal. You know, the Sheik type of tweet uh, where he gives some love there to uh, Mr. Gilbert Gottfried. Uh, rest in peace. Funny guy. Yeah, I was shocked at that myself. Yeah, and if you're not familiar, if you're a little younger and you, and you don't know who Gilbert Gottfried is, um, 
He's got a famous part in Beverly Hills Cop 2, which is freaking hilarious. YouTube that or any of his stand A lot of voiceovers, a lot yeah, of commercials. He's got such a unique voice and personality. Um, yeah, rest in peace, Gilbert Gottfried. And then, of course, uh, The Sheik would not, I mean, it wouldn't be complete if his week did not include a little uh, love for Hulk Hogan. Of course. And there it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, his middle finger is in pretty good shape there. And uh, I don't know if that's his Hall of Fame ring maybe he's wearing there. Um, and not too many guys can wear a t-shirt with a picture of themselves yeah. on it. You know, I mean, that's uh, that's impressive shit. So, uh, yeah, fuck Hulk Hogan from The Sheik. <laughs> uh, but we love The Sheik, and uh, we always get a kick out of that. So, uh, thank you, Iron Sheik, for providing us with a little bit of filler uh, entertainment on our podcast. We always love that. And, uh, of course, Chris, uh, the main, the main uh, point of our show is the classic wrestling, right? And Chris here, of course, as we know, has an unbelievable collection of um, just stuff that other guys are reaching out to you for that uh, yeah. should have this shit, right? Yeah, Chris right. has got it. And we're going to unleash the vault today. Uh, we got some clips for us, Chris. Why don't you tell us what it's all about, man? Yes, as we do each and every week, these clips are uh, from my own personal collection. And uh, here we go, John. We're going to first uh, some clips together of our guest today. Speaking of Gene Ligon, Mr. Right? Gene Ligon, we're going to yes, see in action uh, here uh, he against a quite few people. Champion. Thank this, you, Greg. That's that guy in the blonde hair, Mr. Ric Flair. Right? Who could not know the nature boy, right, John? Oh, absolutely. I love this lock up here. We're going to see. Collar up, elbow tie up. Yeah, look at this. And it's just all yeah, this is collegiate wrestling. You know what I mean? This is yes, like the technical yeah. stuff. Here we go. This and is early eighties, right? This is uh yeah, mid eighty, nineteen eighty five, 1985 on the Superstation WTBS. And there you see, yeah, Tommy Young, I believe. This is in the ring. High definition, by the way. And uh, here we go, uh, Arn Anderson against Gene Ligon here. Another member of the Horsemen. Yes. Uh, that Gene has taken on here. Gene became a big yep. guy. There he goes. So he's yeah. 160. Said so he was 160, right. but he's got to be in 250 by not here. He's yeah. He looked in the role. Let's and then that. here we yeah, see a, a classic clip. Uh, he wrestled in the WWF, like we said, about 88, 89, and here he took on the Blue Blazer. Right, he so. mentioned Owen Hart as we were talking about Bret Hart and Montreal sc uh, screw job, uh, but there's Owen. Yep, course. and then of course, uh, you can go demolition. Yeah, axe and smash against Gene Ligon and uh, Conquistador there. Oh, very good. Okay. But uh, love what he said about being a mask wrestler. I thought that was cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, that he liked it because it kind of gave him a chance to he didn't have to show everything. And know? here he is against the one and only the Stinger. Oh yeah. That was in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, center stage, 1989 here. Oh, yeah, early sting with the uh, California yes. spike and all that stuff. And there's Gino. Um, he, you know, like you said, John, I mean, he, he definitely bulked up from 160, as you can tell there. Definitely looks the role of perfect. And here he took on the Z-Man, also known as Tom Zink. Tom Zink. And here, I believe, uh, Gene had a partner uh, against the Freebirds here. Yep, as we hear uh, David Crockett on the call. And then here's Gene towards his uh, end of the career here. This was the IWA around 90, 91. Great interview today. Some of the stuff, again, that he gave out was outstanding. Yeah. And talking about... Uh, just incredible stuff. You got to listen. That's a great one. Yep. And here's a clip of him uh, talking uh, back in uh, early 2000s at the NWA Fan Fest. You know, it's funny that he mentioned the uh, the food in uh, the WWF because I've seen that even recently to where uh, some of the guys that have gone from a WWE to AEW said, what's the difference? They said, well, the food's not as good. <laughs> so the catering's been top-notch there, I guess, forever. So. Wow. And here we jump. Uh, guys, how can we forget the beginning of the uh, WWF really putting on a map? Yes, sir. The golden era. Um, 1985 with MTV, WWF connection there. How many people wanted a rubber band on their face uh, when they saw <laughs> Captain Lou, right? I know I did at one point as, at 9 or 10 years old. But now old. with the pin in your face, though. <laughs> well... Hey. I wanted to. My parents wouldn't let me. <laughs> but here, uh, Alan Hunter, right? Alan Hunter. Anybody who watched and, and remember uh, early MTV knows of Alan Hunter, MTV one of the VJs. music and shit. Right. Yeah, back yeah. in the day. 
early Music. 80s, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wish we could go back. Pioneer there, Cindy Lauper. Cindy yep. Lauper. Cindy Lauper, Captain Lou. Not in the Hall of Fame, Chris. I can't believe no, that. No, uh, yeah, I can't believe that. I kind of mention it every year, but I guess my voice gets nowhere. That's all right. We're going to get it out there, man. <laughs> yep. And here, of course, classic hot rod rowdy roddy piper and the ace bob orton there of course playing the heel at the time there's only one hot rod as we know classic beating up cindy lopper's uh, husband there at the time the body slam yeah it was great dave wolf gets it he punts her five yards across the ring, <laughs> he says. <laughs> and here we go, right? The classic beginning of the war oh, to yeah. settle the score, which uh, I have the whole card from uh, MSG. That was February 85. I have the whole card in its entirety. But uh, this show only showed that one match, the main event, Piper Hogan. Political and artistic implications. Listening to Oakland, this is Oakland's best. History. I think the war settled the score. Yeah. Some of the stuff that gets said here is, is legend to me, legendary the announcing the stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Gino, I mean, Gene, the was, uh, stuff he's yelling uh, out. You know, they are. I am lost. I am lost. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then he's Daniel Hunter, where the devil are. I mean, it's just some of the funniest stuff. You'll see him in shortly here. We're going to see him backstage. You know, in the locker room. Yeah. The locker room of Madison Square Garden was chaotic then after that match as we'll see and uh is that what you're trying to say i remember watching this back in the day on mtv but to have the whole card is great and a lot of matches that that card we talk about some of the uh, legendary announced teams uh but on a side note whenever there's interaction between me and gene and bobby heenan i always thought it was hilarious oh and here we had Mean Gene and Gorilla Monsoon on the call, but Andy Warhol. I was just going to ask, who the heck is that? Pants, <laughs> I remember that. Remember, that was his thing. He's the artist. He was kind of bizarre here, not too talk. You know what I mean? They just, yeah. they just let's get some money. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like one of the Dudley boys that uh, got got. Rejected or something, man. What in the hell? Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, yeah, that's uh yeah, I thought you'd get a kick of these, John. I love this part. Yeah, right, all the different celebrities coming into the locker room. doesn't know what's going on. This is live. This is awesome. Right, live on MTV that night. And now he's going to listen. Ladies and gentlemen, on MTV, the war to settle the score turned into an absolute melee. It was just unbelievable. The melee. If I could bring in other dignitaries, who do we have standing by? Please, if I may, well, we got some other really uh, fabulous people. You, you talk about a lot of people that are big fans of wrestling and rock and roll. I think that we oh have. Oh, my word. Other, there he is. Yeah. Joe, Joe Piscopo, as a matter of fact. Joe, come on in if you would. Oh, yeah, this was funny. No Joe Piscopo? Yeah. Oh, my God. Young yeah. Joe Piscopo. Yeah. 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 85. Didn't he do Monday Night Football for a year? Or am I mistaken? I don't know. I know the other guy did. I'm not sure. What's his name? Who was the other comedian? I was forgetting his name. Maybe that's one of Oh, Dennis Miller. Dennis Miller. That's why I mixed him up with Dennis Miller. Very good. I like that. That is a very good analogy. Joe, some of the other matches that you saw here. He got the sweat off Hogan there in the locker room. Yeah, well, when the girls got wrestling, that was pretty hot. Actually, I'm here, you know, the captain brought us down. Of course, Danny DeVito, we saw that last week. Right. He lost the planes to him. The tattoo reference. Joe, if we could, I want to bring in... The newer Fantasy Island show is pretty good, I think. Yeah, it's a it's a girl, but it's a uh, they make her a relative of Mr. Warren. So, uh, no, but they got a girl, another girl as tattoo, because she had a tattoo on her back. So that kind of spun into that. But Billy Squire, that's what I was trying to talk to you about. He was pissed off at Paul Orndorff here for breaking the guitar. Oh, man. And Good luck with that. Lucky Piper wasn't in here. With the, the way these guys were going, he might have got. He might have yeah, got slapped or something yeah. here. I don't know. He definitely gets slapped. But, uh, wow. Oh, this is one of my favorites.
favorites right here. Here man. we go. We kind of call these clips with the mighty midgets. Yes, sir. Or and, little uh, people. Little people, Chris. Little we don't people. want to offend anybody here. Well, you know, it, talking classic <laughs> wrestling, we can get away with the mighty midgets, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And here goes one of the kibosh. What the... Uh, Bob Uecker said he put the kibosh on Little Beaver. <laughs> This, uh, of course, was uh, 87, Pontiac Silverdome, WrestleMania 3. Oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of moments that night, but, of course, unfortunately, yeah, this was a moment. <laughs> I remember Little Tokyo there. I don't remember the other names. I uh, the Haiti think. Kid. The Haiti uh, Kid was there, yes. Lord Littlebrook. Yes. And Little Lord Brook. Littlebrook. Yep. And here, uh, of course, oh, uh, Who was Beaver just keeps getting it. Yeah. <laughs> and here, this time, this was the one-man gang in the Boston Garden. Splash. <laughs> Uh, beating on that beaver and i'm not gonna make this into an x-rated show yeah, no. uh, <laughs> little beaver's just looking yeah. twitching and then little beaver guys, yeah, yeah. the metro dome. yep here we go uh, uh also a part of the awa not just the wwf and they put these guys in there with like the biggest guys possible bundy the one-man gang can't you get cut him a break throw him in there with the uh... andre a couple times yeah. i remember yeah the guy low low guy. trying to match yeah. up <laughs> yeah <laughs> There we go, Lord Littlebrook here and uh, Little Tokyo. And the announcer makes a mistake. Y yes, funny. Gary Michael Capetta, <laughs> only one. 101 pounds. Uh, correction. <laughs> See, he's laughing. 98 pounds. Of course he's from Tokyo, Japan, because he's Little Tokyo, right? Right. And you're going to see... And yeah, and their opponents are uh, Legend, little Mr. T here. Yeah, check this out, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> little Mr. T. The gold, man, the gold around the neck. Uh, the metro, yeah. If you grew up like we did in the the '80s with Mr. T, everybody wanted that look, man. A mohawk and some gold around the neck. Yeah, and uh, here we go, Cowboy Lang, <laughs> and another uh, mighty midget name. Man, they were all over the territory. You Southwest, know, WWF, since, uh, AWA, all Hornswoggle, over. Hornswoggle, um, we haven't really seen the little guys anymore, man. Like, Hornswoggle no, was like the last They kind of, of faded away into the 90s. They faded away. Yeah, and I, although I do believe Hornswoggle is on the independent circuit somewhere. We'll have to look into that. But yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys don't really see them anymore. And They're here we go. Business. We got a little feature on uh, Superfly Jimmy Snuka. And uh, John, as you've seen... Not too many people can kick out of the Superfly Splash there, as we saw. This one is Kevin Von Erich, and this was Georgia, 1982. Kevin Von Erich, and there was one other, right, that kicked out of that movie? Yep, we're going to see that right now from uh, early ECW. Ah, oh, very good. And uh, this was Tommy, Dr young Tommy Dreamer. Wow. So, yeah, only uh, only two people that could kick out of that. Now, this is ECW around where, 90. This was a uh, 93, 94... As we hear Joey Styles with the call. Oh yeah, Joey Styles. Oh my God. Boom! Oh. On the Tommy Dreamer. One, two. No, he kicks out. Well, Look at the face on the Superfly. Well, second history to kick out. Wow. Yep. Surprised. And here, uh, this was uh, Snooka's chance to get the heavyweight title from Mr. Bob Backlund, Madison Square Garden, 1982. But uh, as we hear, see John, what happens? Oh, yeah. Backlund just yikes! Rolls away, and the Superfly is uh, feet in the air, so reeling on the it's canvas. A hell of a drop there, yeah. Backlund, just, he's gonna do it again. Yep, this and Piper, here we go. Nope, this oh. was the feud with Morocco. Oh, Morocco. Okay. How could we wow, forget? 1983 on, here. He's feud. so high up. He's not even on screen. There he comes. Boom! Oh, wow. And Morocco Busted gets the splash. Over. They had to carry him out after that. Really? Yep. Wow. Had to carry him out. Captain Lou didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, there you go. Yeah. Some uh, classic clips as we do each and every week. Wow, the Superfly, man. That's, uh, we talked about this off air. We talk about it often. I know the three of us sometimes. That war to settle the score was yeah. just something that I can never forget. Kicking off, like you, you guys, it's called the Golden Era, I guess. Right, yeah. But yeah. it was a point, I think I made this, try to make this point one time before to you guys, but it was almost more beyond it. Like, yeah. I felt like it was before it's ahead of its time, because there was so much going on there. Yes. And so much that was almost more Attitude Era-like. Yeah. 
but they got away with a little bit more than yeah. they do now. And Absolutely. then they used it wow. into uh, WrestleMania two in '86 too, with the yeah. Mr. T, Piper, and what all the celebrities Brilliant. and whatnot. And, and the cool thing about it was because it was the first time wrestling it really bled into the mainstream, like in the pop culture, like it did. I mean, there's I'm I'm sure wrestling fans have seen them, the the classic uh, glasses that you would get at McDonald's yeah. and whatnot. They used to have the collectors cups with like an animated picture of the wrestlers on it. The LJN figures from back in the day that yes. you'd find for like three or four bucks on an end cap at Hills, and it would make your day, man, buying one of those. Yeah, um, yeah those were the days, man, yeah. that uh, where, you know, yeah, we call it the golden era, and it was a little bit more innocent times before the Attitude Era, but yeah, they were able to get away with a little bit more uh, content-wise back then than they, they could now. I mean, geesh, yeah. everything's so uh, criticized now. It's unbelievable, and I... Um... I think if you're a wrestling fan out there, a younger one, that's a good thing to watch because that really shows you where I believe it all just. Yeah, 100%. And comes. then um, WWE, and I believe they were still WWF at the time, mm -hmm. uh, had a, a, another relationship with MTV down the road. I think it was Sunday Night Heat was on MTV oh, for wow. a while there. Oh, yes. Um, right? And then there was a Shotgun Saturday Night. I don't know if that was at USA or MTV, but they had a small relationship for a little while after that uh, in, the, in the 90s, but it didn't materialize like it did back then. Um, and of course, MTV we know is this more reality TV than it is music. Uh, but yeah, interesting stuff, man. Thanks, Chris, for that. And um, of course, we want to give some recognition this week to our enhancement talent, and that is uh, Mr. Ricky Ataki this week, the Japan mm. Bomber. Which, my gosh, maybe wow. they could have come up with a better name uh, post Pearl <laughs> Harbor, right? Uh, the Japan Bomber, Ricky Ataki, uh, real name Lauren Miyaki, Lauren Miyaki. Uh, you know, he um, never won a match in a WWF, but that's okay. Um, and there was actually a clip I, I ran across. I should have brought it in, but uh, there was one match that he had with Ted DiBiase. Uh, and before the match started, DiBiase and Virgil just tried to pay him off to go take a walk, but he did not. <laughs> um, and it was fine. It was tough to find some info on uh, Mr. Ataki here. Um, don't know where necessarily he was born. I saw California on, on a different website, uh, Pro Fight M, uh, Pro Fight db profightdatabase.com has him listed as unknown um so yeah a little mysterious there but he did wrestle 30 matches total and i believe it was 0 and 18 he was in uh, the wwf days but a shout out to ricky ataki our uh, enhancement uh, talent of the week and also the other thing i wanted to bring up too and uh, which we found this funny and the sheik was having some fun with it uh wait if you can go down to that clip at the very bottom there you have uh, the two guys standing next to each other now, I've, I'm finding this to be hilarious with Elias. Um, now, Elias is completely shaved down and is now Ezekiel. But the funny, the fun that they're having with it is, is no, no, no. These are two different guys. Two different guys. And then, of course, uh, the Photoshopped, or is it Photoshopped? As haters will say, it's Photoshopped, but we know the truth. I think this is kind of a fun angle that they're doing here. And the fact that they're allowing Kevin Owens on WWF, uh, WWE television to kind of call it out. Uh, as he's going around introducing himself as Ezekiel, the shaved guy on the right, Kevin Owens is calling him out and saying, no, 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 you're Elias. I remember you. You had the beard like as he's <laughs> represented on the left. I just think that's freaking hilarious. I wanted to end the show on that because if you haven't watched any uh, WWE Raw, which even with me sometimes, I'll tape a three-hour Raw and then I'll go to the DVR and watch it in like an hour and a half because you really can't sit through three hours sometimes. But um, I thought a fun storyline with that was the, uh, the Ezekiel and Elias thing. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, we're gonna you know we're gonna wrap up here, Chris, and and um, you know we want to mention the Gorilla Zinc stores we did uh, after the break there. We want to mention the store more in depth. Um, you know we have some sports memorabilia available on there, some cards, t-shirts, mugs, hats, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I think Way's gonna throw it in the comment section there on the show. If you click on that. Um, some good deals, man. Like, you, there's jerseys you can yes. find on there for, uh, you know, like 75 bucks where a lot of sites, you know, you're paying 130 150 Check it out. It's cool shit um, that we're selling there that Gorilla Zinc is selling there. Yeah, just a real quick shout out. Uh, as we do, we don't want to forget about Elena DiPaolo, John. Yeah, and, updates uh, on Thoughts that, John? and prayers for her. Uh, Elena again. Elena DiPaolo, our friend, our good friend of Gorilla Zinc and all of us here. Um, real quick, I'll recap her. She's a young, young lady. You got a little baby. Still in her 20s, right? Uh, maybe early, early, 30s. early 30s. It doesn't matter. Uh, she, yeah. um, she had leukemia and beat it. But when beating leukemia, she ends up uh, having kidney failure and finds out she needs a kidney transplant. Um, she didn't want to get dialysis, but she's on dialysis now. Um, 
She's one of the toughest people we've ever met. Um, unbelievable. Always with a smile on her face. Always happy, even though going through this horrible stuff. We need to find her a donor. Um, 716-898-5001 is the number to uh, ECMC up here in Western New York. It does. You don't have to be in Western New York. Be anywhere in the country, right. anywhere in Canada, please. If you think you can be a donor, call that number. If you can't do that, just go on the Gorillas Inc. pages, all of our pages, and uh, share her story, please. 100%. Everywhere you can. And please, if you can, Twitter, Insta, everywhere. Yeah. All social media. Yeah, you know, John, it's, you know, as you're giving this information out, I'm thinking here, man, just just giving out this information on a weekly basis, it's like, man, I would love to have one of these shows end where we're like, hey, we got a donor, yes. um, and she's on the road recovery. And that goes for anybody going through this type of thing. Um, we're going to get one. Yeah, it's a coming. difficult thing, I can't imagine. But, uh, yeah, we're going to... And we can't forget to say uh, happy Passover, happy Easter this weekend. Yeah, happy Easter, you know, if that's your thing. Um, you know, I I'm into it. You know, I'll eat some ham on Sunday and all that good stuff. You know, the importance of the holidays, the food, right? <laughs> no, but... <laughs> the uh, chocolate. The chocolate, the chocolate of course. Bunny. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, now, that leads me to a question. When did you stop getting Easter baskets? For me, oh. I was maybe 11, 12 years old. I, but it was still fun. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Something in there, maybe even mm. a little sooner for me. Yeah. I'm gonna say, uh, possibly. Yeah, I might think it was sooner. I might have been eight or nine. We need to bring back when, the adult so, like Easter egg hunt. Yeah, I would love to go on an Easter. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, we could put like uh, alcohol, like yeah. little airport bottles yeah. of alcohol in the eggs. You know, yeah. Uh, make an adult version of it. Yeah, I'm with that. You know, but yeah, happy Easter to everybody. Enjoy the holiday. Again, next week, um, we're hoping to have Mr. George Shire join us. And again, thank you to Mr. Gene Ligon uh, for joining us on today's show. And thank you for everybody that took the time uh, to watch. Uh, to Robin, uh, thank you so much for sharing the content. To Wade for your uh, production work. To John uh, for joining us. And to Chris, my co-host here, uh, for the clips and, and your wrestling knowledge, your wealth of wrestling knowledge that carries my ass through this show because i don't know a lot of this <laughs> shit but chris does man so i'm thankful for that and uh, we're thankful for you watching and uh, we'll see you again next week hopefully uh, right here on uh, falls Con anywhere thanks again for joining us take care